This is the Cater Daily Podcast for Tuesday, September 29th, 2020. I'm Caleb Brown. Just how deferential would Judge Amy Coney Barrett be to administrative agencies? What areas of law give us the clearest picture of her judicial philosophy and how it would be expressed on the Supreme Court if she's confirmed? Andrew Grossman is an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. He comments. You do more than most when it comes to understanding uh, how judges think based upon what they've written. What are your general takes on Amy Coney Barrett? Well, everybody has so much to say about Judge Barrett, but at the end of the day, she's being nominated to serve on a court. And the best way to get a sense of a judge's judicial philosophy, judicial temperament, and so forth is to actually read their opinions. And so that's what I sat down and did. And she's published about 100 opinions uh, since being. Uh, Placed on the Seventh Circuit. And she is a textualist par excellence. Um, she said yesterday that she considers herself to, uh, to be a judge in the mold of Justice Scalia, following the text of statutes, the text of the Constitution, the original meaning. But it's not only a soundbite for her, that's what you see in case after case. She takes these complicated issues, makes them simple, and goes right to the sources. And she's very good at it. In any particular area where she shows a, a strong inclination that uh, libertarians would appreciate? Well, I think there are a lot of things. Uh, the place I'd probably start is just why libertarians in general are supportive of the textualist mode of uh, judicial uh, ju- judicial philosophy for a good reason, because frequently you wind up with the government trying to go outside of the bounds of the law. You have the executive branch. Uh, you know, taking cases on novel legal theories or trying to skirt the facts and so on and so forth. And so a judge, somebody like Justice Scalia or somebody like Judge Barrett, who actually holds the government to the law, to what's written in the statute, you know, that goes a long way uh, towards enforcing due process rights. Because, you know, if you can read the law and you can understand the law, you are on an equal footing with the government in court, which unfortunately isn't always the case. Other judges look at things and they give the benefit of the doubt to the government. But that's not something that Judge Barrett has done. In both her academic work, which is considerable, and uh, authoring uh, more than 100 opinions uh, on the Seventh Circuit, is what areas are missing? Well, I think I think there are two things that I would identify. If you look back at her career, one thing that makes her a little bit different from some of the other recent nominees is that she's never served in the executive branch, and I think there are pluses and minuses to that. Um, You know, the minus might be that she simply doesn't have that sort of experience. But the plus is that a lot of judges are willing to give the benefit of the doubt to the executive branch, particularly to executive agencies. Um, She doesn't have that type of background. And I think that may. And so she looks at it from the point of view of people who are subject to things that the executive agencies do rather than somebody serving in those agencies. So to my mind, it might be a little bit of a lack of experience that other justices have. But I think that could actually be a plus. Uh, The other I would note, and it's kind of related, is administrative law cases. The Seventh Circuit doesn't get a ton of agency cases, but they do get some, and she has decided a few. Uh, There are two, I think, that I would that I would mention. Uh, The first, she has had uh, she has decided um, a case involving the uh, Waters of the United States rule under the Clean Water Water Act. Um, She joined an opinion with Judge Saint Eve that declined to defer to the agency when the agency was pushing very, very hard for deference to its regulations. And I think that says a lot because, again, you look at most courts, that is exactly the area where they would say, well, agency, you wrote the regulations, and this is what you say they mean, and so we're going to go with you. Here you have somebody's property rights at issue. The agency is trying to prevent them from constructing uh, on land that they own. And the court was unwilling to go with the agency and said, no, we're going to take a look at the law and figure out what it means for ourselves. Uh, The second area that I would point to, and this is something I think that's a bit uh, below the radar, her social security decisions. The courts of appeals get tons of these. Somebody's denied benefits by the government and they appeal it. Often in many courts of appeals, these cases are effectively decided by staff attorneys. Sure, the judges sign off on the opinions, but it's really the staff attorneys who draft them and work through the issues and the judges more or less just rubber stamp them. (laughs) That is not Judge Barrett's uh, modus operandi. 
Judge Barrett has been unusually aggressive in scrutinizing the agency's factual determinations, in working through the factual records her, her, herself, and in making sure that everything is being done by the book and then the right decisions are being uh, reached with respect to citizens' rights. And the reason why I think that's such an important thing uh, is these are social security cases. Nobody, unless you get uh, appointed to the Supreme Court, nobody's going to read these. Uh, they're really just of interest to the litigants themselves. And so when you can see that she has been so aggressive and really so, you know, really undertaken very firm scrutiny of the government's factual findings in cases that are out of the public light, I think that speaks volumes. And it, and it says a very good thing about how she regards the government and, you know, that she holds it to the same standards that other litigants face. Based on what you've read of her work, uh, both academic and uh, on the bench, is there somebody on the court with whom she will be uh, most likely to be a fellow traveler? I think she is very much a writer and, and an originalist uh, in the mode of Justice Gorsuch. Um, I don't think they're going to be together in 100% of cases, but I think it's going to be pretty high. They were both considered to be, when they were both on the courts of appeals, two of the finest courts of appeals judges and two of the staunchest textualists, uh, again, in the mode of Justice Scalia. Both of them identified Justice Scalia as sort of their leading light uh, in terms of how to function as a judge. But even more so than Justice Gorsuch, I think where she differs from him a little bit, and also from Justice Scalia, is she has a much greater sense of, you might say, humility. Um, Justice Barrett is willing to be persuaded by the litigants. She reads what they have to say. She takes their arguments seriously. And she comes into the judicial task with a, a real kind of inherent sense of modesty that, you know, she's going to have to do the work. She's going to have to figure out the cases. And so while Justice Gorsuch can be a little bit aggressive, he can be perhaps some, at times a little bit overconfident uh, in his uh, interpretation of the law, Judge Barrett really goes through and does all the, does and, and goes through all the precedents and all the text, and she shows her work. Um, and so it, it really is, I think, a very rigorous form of textualism. And I think it'll put her pretty close to Justice Gorsuch and pretty close to Justice Thomas too. You mentioned Scalia, and uh, I know that Scalia famously said that he should be a pinup girl for the defense bar. So what do we know about uh, Judge Barrett's uh, views on criminal justice issues? Well, again, she's very much in the Scalia mold here, uh, but she might even be a little bit more solicitous to procedural due process rights. This is the idea that somebody gets their day in court, uh, that they get to you know, raise all the issues that are important to them, and that they have an opportunity to put their case to the government and make sure that it gets decided in a fair and unbiased manner. Um, I think the leading case here, and it's probably one of her most influential decisions, uh, is a decision called Doe versus P Purdue University. It's one of these uh, flood of cases coming out of universities uh, concerning uh, adjudication of sexual assault changes. Um, the university here, uh, there was a male who was accused of sexual assault. Um, he disputed the charge. The university refused to uh, give him the evidence that was uh, being uh, asserted against him. He refused to consider the exculpatory evidence he wanted to put forward. And, and it wouldn't even interview witnesses. In fact, it wouldn't even interview the accuser, despite that the, the university ultimately said that its account was more credible than his. Ju Judge Barrett worked through the precedents in the area, you know, and, and determined, you know, this just falls short of any minimum amount of due process that a public university would have to offer to students. And it was just at the end of the day, fundamentally unfair. And her framework for how it is the university should look at this. This decision came out about a year, a year, year and a half ago, and it's proven immensely influential. It's been picked up by something like half the courts of appeals now and been cited in dozens of district court uh, decisions. Uh, likewise, you know, a number of cases you have uh, just citizens coming into court without uh, legal counsel, uh, what's called pro se. And Judge Barrett has been very firm about the idea that when you have a complicated case, when somebody's rights are at stake, the courts really abuse their discretions. They don't do justice if they don't uh, allow those people to have the assistance of counsel, which, you know, from time to time when you're dealing with important rights, that's something that the court is going to have to pay for just to make sure that their rights are adequately briefed and adequately uh, argued to the court. Again, that's a little bit unusual, I think, for a court of appeals judge. Normally, these things fall by the wayside, but Judge Barrett takes the idea that you have the right to have your 
arguments, to have your rights expressed clearly and to make your case, she takes that very seriously. You note in the Wall Street Journal, you and uh, David Rivkin uh, wrote a piece uh, in the opinion section, What Kind of Judge is Amy Coney Barrett? Hello, David. How are you doing today? Uh, You write, uh, U.S. v. Watson was a Fourth Amendment case. The court considered whether police had reasonable suspicion to block a parked car based on an anonymous report that, quote, boys were, quote, playing with guns, end quote, nearby. Judge Barrett, writing for a unanimous panel, concluded they didn't because Indiana law permits carrying a firearm in public without a license. That tip didn't create a reasonable suspicion of a crime, even if it might have been prudent for police to visit the scene and speak with those involved voluntarily. Judge Barrett rejected out of hand the government's argument that a more forceful response could be justified based on the locale, Quote, people who live in rough neighborhoods may want, and in many cases, in many situations, may carry guns for protection. They should not be subject to more intrusive police practices than are those from wealthy neighborhoods. Wow, that that, that really seems to speak to a lot of the concerns of our present moment. It really does. And I think it really reflects a deeper kind of more even handed view of the administration of the law. You know, there's not a law for the rich and a law for the poor. and You know, everybody agrees with that at a 10,000 foot level, sure. But the question is, how does a judge take that basic equal protection under law idea and apply it in a particular case? And Judge Barrett's opinion in Watson really shows how, in her mind, the rubber meets the road. There aren't two sets of laws. Um, Everybody enjoys the same. And it shows that she's also aware, uh, you know, of these issues that have risen up uh, in recent years about uh, overreaching in the criminal justice system, uh, about overcriminalization, and about abusive uh, policing. And it shows, I think, that she has a real sensitivity to that. Andrew Grossman is an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. Subscribe to the Cato Daily Podcast anywhere you please and follow us on Twitter at Cato Podcast. 